The new Mac Mini is here. This one is the base model M4 Pro version, and that's a 12 core CPU, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. The base model M4 Pro also has some benefits over the base model M4. It already comes with 24 gigabytes of RAM as the base. That one comes with 16, and this one comes with 512 gigabytes for storage. So this is my initial impressions of this machine. I'll be doing performance reviews and battery tests and comparing it to the less powerful M4 in another video coming soon. And by less powerful, they're both pretty powerful, okay? I don't know which one is which. They're not labeled, especially these Thunderbolt ports. On the M4, it's Thunderbolt 4, and on the M4 Pro, let's just assume it's this one, it's Thunderbolt 5. Thunderbolt 4 gives you 40 gigabit per second transfer speed. Thunderbolt 5 gives you twice that, 80. But you can find out the model if you really squint really hard and you use a microscope. It's on the, it's on the shell. So the one thing in common with these two is they have the same design. And there's good news and there's bad news when it comes to design. First of all, let's talk about size. And this one is tricky. Apple is really into making things smaller, but it's not without sacrifice. Why is smaller better sometimes? Well, it's portability. It's gonna take up a lot less space on the desk than this. It's a lot lighter. This is the previous Mac Mini, by the way. This is the M2 Pro model, weighing at 1.279 kilograms, and the new one weighing 0.659 kilograms kilograms much smaller 0.73 kilograms for the other one any guesses which one is which but they weigh differently the m4 and the m4 pro now this thing is perfect for those that just want to slap one on their desk and they're ready to roll because now unlike the previous model these have ports on the front you got the headphone jack and you got two usb-c ports on the front which is convenient when you have it on your desk but the downside to that is that the mac mini has been such an iconic design for so many years there's a ton of infrastructure built around this specific shape. There's entire server farms that have these lined up next to each other. And again, on the one hand, having a server farm that's smaller is gonna be good, take up less space. But on the other hand, people will need to change all their mounting hardware. If you're building a cluster or rack, the old design is way better for allowing everything from one side, and that made wiring way easier. And they were the perfect size for one rack space. The new design not only makes wiring more difficult because now you need wires from the front and from the back, but it doesn't fit into one rack space. This is not an iFixit or a Linus because now I'm broke. So I bought the cheap kit, link down below, but it looks like it's got everything I need. Oh, that's a crack. I don't know what the heck I'm doing, so. If you're not running Wi-Fi, you might be able to get away without having this piece. So if you're one of those that buys this out of the box and wants to use it that way and wants to use a cluster of that, you're probably gonna end up using two rack spaces for the height of this. Gotta switch gears for a bit and talk about some good stuff. We'll be back to the bad stuff in a moment. You can hook up three monitors into this because it's an M4 Pro chip. The previous generation M2 Pros could only handle two monitors, so you can now do three. Yes, I did try four monitors, but it didn't work just like the website said. But I think three 4K monitors should be plenty for most people. This is without Display Link, by the way. If you use Display Link, which is a technology that lets you share video signal over USB, it degrades the signal, makes the performance a little worse. I made different videos comparing Display Link and how it affects performance. I'll link to that down below. So we're not doing Display Link here, just native. Now I'll also be doing some more machine learning related tests here, but I wanted to do a quick Olama test with Llama 3.2, 2 billion, because on the live stream, I got 107 tokens per second on the M4 Max. So I was curious to see how much the M4 Pro would put out. And there's a pretty big drop. I got 62 tokens here, all while using 77 watts of power. Not exactly sipping that power either. And I've noticed that this machine uses more power while sitting there doing just regular everyday tasks like watching YouTube video, having IDE open. So I'm not sure what accounts for that, but it's interesting to note that. The internal SSD is much faster than the previous generation. So there's a big boost there, which is really nice to see. Of course, I did the regular web browser tests, one for JavaScript. This is Speedometer 3.0, got a really nice score of 42.6. Not 47 like I got on the M4 Max during the live stream, but still a really nice result respectable score higher than my previous M2 Max, which goes about 38. And Jetstream 2 is another web-based test. And this one does more than JavaScript. It does TypeScript, WASM, and other web technologies. And I got 504 on this. 
During the live stream, I got 480 on my M4 Max. I think that maybe I should run it a couple more times to see what the final score will be, but 504 is really high. One other thing that's gonna be key in machine learning tasks is memory bandwidth. Of course, the M4 Max has the highest memory bandwidth that we've ever seen in a Max chip, but the M4 Pros also have the highest bandwidth we've seen in the Pro chips. So I ran Stream, which is a common memory bandwidth measurement benchmark. It's pretty old and has been around for a while and therefore it's consistent and of course the rates pretty much match up to what the specs say which is really nice all right one more picky thing notice i'm using usb a keyboards mice they like to use usb a well that's no longer the case because with the new models only usb c is available so you're going to need to have some kind of dock or dongle we're getting deeper into the dongle territory for apple but we're kind of used to it at this point all right speaking of design the power button okay it, it, this it's making a big stink around the internet. The power button used to be right here on the old Mac mini. That's nice and easy. Now the power button is, well, it's on the bottom, as you might've heard. And when this thing is placed down, there's no way to fit your finger in there unless you have really, really, really tiny fingers, like a child's finger. Most people that I know will keep this thing on 24 seven, but I have had some commenters leave comments saying that they will turn it off nightly. Now, there's a couple of solutions to this. Some are funny and some are not. One is keeping it upside down. The problem with that is you're gonna have dust gathering inside the vents, so that's not good. Or you can 3D print a little gadget that you'll press and it'll turn the power on and off for you. There you go, that's a solution. Or just lift it up, it's light, okay? You're gonna get some exercise, it's not bad. But really Apple, other people have pulled this off before. It's not that difficult. Right there, there's a power button on the front, okay? But one thing other people have not pulled off is having the power supply be all inside. You only need to hook up one cable here and everything's inside, even the power supply, which is really convenient. Normal wall warts or external power supplies like other machines have. Now for a long time, the Mac minis were kind of like an underpowered machine. If you were serious and you were doing some heavy workflows, you couldn't do it on a Mac mini. They were good machines for lots of tasks. But ever since Apple came out with the M2 Pro and they put that in the Mac mini, things have shifted in people's minds. I think the machines have become more versatile. The M2 Pros were already pretty powerful. Apple skipped the M3 Pros and the Mac minis and they went right into the M4 Pros and the Mac minis, which are insanely powerful. And sometimes the M4 Pro matches the Ultra benchmark scores. They're now super powerful machines that aren't just for small tasks. Of course, the base model M4 Mini will excel at everyday tasks such as web browsing, video streaming, office work, and video meetings while maintaining smooth performance for casual users. It would even make an excellent developer box too. Web developers and Xcode developers will feel pretty comfortable here. Now I'll compare the models in more detail in other videos, specific benchmark tests for developers as well, so make sure you don't miss that. But the M4 Pro is a powerhouse for developers developer tasks. It'll not only run your editors and IDEs, but it'll run Docker containers, Android emulators, and virtual machines with ease, especially with the 32 gigabytes and 64 gigabyte versions. If you lean heavier on the virtualization side with your developer workflows, I run parallels when I need to use Windows on my Mac for Visual Studio and SQL Server, for example, and that works pretty well on my daily driver M2 Max MacBook Pro. But this little box is way cheaper than my laptop yet way more powerful. Now I made a bunch of videos about using Windows on a Mac and I'll link to some of them down below if you're interested. Now of course it'll do some of your nerdier tasks too, like running the home media server Plex, you can do Home Assistant, Open Assistant, Nextcloud, VPNs, and of course local LLMs. You can even set up a cluster of these to work together and it'll take up a very small footprint on your desk or somewhere else. Now in general the M4 lineup is really impressive. This is my next machine that's going to replace the M2 Max MacBook Pro, and this is the M4 Max. Definitely stay tuned on the channel to see comparisons, benchmarks, and battery tests on these. In fact, I've got the entire lineup here, M4, M4 Pro, and M4 Max. I'm gonna be doing tests on that, so make sure you're subscribed to not miss that. But besides the MacBook Pros that are way, way more expensive than Mac Minis, there's something to be said for these when it comes to being on your desk or in a portable mode. Because like I mentioned in videos before, you buy the core machine, but then you can choose whatever monitor you want. You can choose whatever keyboard you want and for a lot less money than a whole system like a MacBook Pro, yet you're getting really powerful stuff in here. So here you go. My first impressions on these are pretty positive. I was never such a huge fan of Mac minis until now, and I could easily recommend this 
as a good machine to buy. Now, which one is going to be better for which type of task? Stay tuned as well for that. You know, I keep saying that, but yeah, more videos coming up. This is just the first impression. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.